I blow up my room once. Just because I crossed two wires when I was making a new type of laser rifle, and he loses all trust in me. It took a couple of hours for Aura to look over my father's wounds. Luckily, his combat armor had taken most of the force out of the shots. During that time, Stryker didn't say much. He only sat next to the small fire, glaring over at myself and my father. Wingnut told me what happened when he was able to escape during the fight. He ran back to camp and started to yell about us being attacked, and that Yaksha was keeping them distracted while Stryker did what he needed to do. Nora was ready to kill the zebra as soon as she found out, but Wingnut ordered her not to. Instead, she took Yaksha with her as they all flew toward where the fight was going on. Yaksha had gone with them willingly. That was the only reason she wasn't tied up right now. Meanwhile, my friends and myself included were waiting for Aura to finish up with my father. Shadow, I am sorry about everything that happened. Yaksha finally said, looking up and over at me, over the fire. Sure you are, Yaksha. He was lying to me about why you wanted to travel with me then. Trying to get me killed is easy to forgive. I said. I never lied to you, Shadow. I told you everything, and answered everything that you asked me truthfully. Ha! I scoffed. How am I supposed to believe that? Prove me wrong, Shadow. If you can find a time that I lied to you, then I will admit it. I think you should let me slit her throat, Aura said from where she was finishing up with Nightshade. Stryker looked over at Aura, saying in a low growl, You hurt her, and I'll hurt you, Griffin. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you will, you creepy-looking buck, Aura said, ignoring him. Stryker, there is no need to defend me, Yaksha said, looking back at me. As I said, I did not lie to you about why I wanted to travel here. I knew that it was in you. It was the same thing that Stryker was looking for. I told him I would confirm my suspicions and see if I could get it out of you. When Aquila blasted me out of your mind, I saw how powerful she really was, and I panicked. So you decided to let Stryker kill her? Wingnut asked. I did not do it just because of Shadow. Stryker was also after the stranger. When I reported he was with Shadow, and was staying a while, I decided it was the perfect time to strike. I did not know he was your father, she said. I sighed. Right now, Yaksha, I don't really care. I have enough going on right now to even bother with your crap. I understand you were scared of what you saw, but still, you should have talked to me about it. Very well, Shadow. So, is this a friend you were looking for anyway? Or was that a lie? Stardust asked. That was not a lie. The name she used last when she was in... Uh, last saw her was Laser Light. I am not sure if she will still be using it, but I know she was last seen near Los Pegasus. That took me by surprise. Wait, Laser? You're the zebra friend she thought died years ago? I asked. Wait a moment. You know Laser? Yaksha asked. How did you meet her? I need to know. Is she well? Is she safe? Is she still alive? I would not be able to forgive myself if I was not there for her on her deathbed. I started to laugh. I met her when I was looking for a ghoul named Nexus. She's his bodyguard. At least I think she is. And she's very much alive. Yaksha looked as if she was holding her breath until I said something about laser light being okay and said, What a relief. Wait, laser is working for that strange ghoul? I would never have thought she would work for him. He is... Very strange. Before I could ask more, Nightshade limped over to us. Aura right behind him. I think that we need to take a few minutes, now that I'm doing better, so we can talk. I'd rather put another bullet in you, Nightshade. But I said I'd give you a chance to explain things. Stryker said. No one is shooting anyone unless I say otherwise. I'm not in the mood to keep patching anyone else up, Aura said, walking past us. Let's leave them all to talk. From the sounds of things, it seems like this is a family affair, and we don't need to be in the middle of it. But I want to hear, Wingnut said. 
Wind Thrasher put a hoof on his shoulder. Not now, Wingnut. Let's leave them alone for a while, okay? They all got up and started to head towards the cliffside. Stardust was the last to leave. If you need us, Shadow, just yell. We won't be far. I nodded. Thanks, Stardust. Once they were gone, Nightshade sighed, saying, So, where should we start? So, you've been the stranger all this time and you didn't even think to try to tell me once? I asked Nightshade as we sat in front of the fire. Shadow, it's not as simple as telling a secret to a close friend. There are groups, organizations, and other factions out there that I have the technology to rip the information from your head. And you didn't have faith that I could take care of myself? I'm the courier, damn it! I'm not easy to kill. I thought I made it obvious when I vaporized a small city in a regional landmark. I exclaimed. Stryker cleared his throat. If you could please stop and listen. I quickly turned on him. Shut up! Can't you see I'm trying to have my first teenage daughter moment with my dad? He stammered a bit, but quickly regained his composure. I understand that you've pretty much lived like an orphan for the last some odd years. But there are more important matters at Hoof. He betrayed our family's trust and values for his own gain. No offense to your past health issues. Are you fucking stupid? This is my dad for goddess's sake. And I deserve an explanation. Your petty sibling rivalry will have to wait. Besides, that was a long time ago and nothing bad has happened yet. I said with a roll in my eyes. Riker glared at me and his eyebrows started to twitch. Nothing bad. It seems to me like you've chosen to ignore that beast in your flesh as well as your head. If you really think getting infected with a parasite such as Aquila is no big deal, then you're either not completely educated on the true nature of Project Stargazer, or you just inherited your father's brains and don't rightly care what happens to the world if Aquila is to get loose in a vessel she can control. Either way, you're a naive little foal with no grasp of true reality this world lives every day. Damn, what a dick. The fuck does he know about what I know about the world? I know the tragedies this goddess-forsaken wasteland throws at a pony. Sure, it hasn't really been long since I left my stable, but out here two months seems more like two years. I've lost friends, killed countless enemies, experienced the odds stacked against me, and helped countless more. If you haven't noticed, I've become the symbol of... more of a symbol than the stranger. Every pony else in the wasteland, I'm some sort of post mare hero with no fear. All you and my father made, the stranger, is an urban legend who is being followed by a robot detective. I even gained fame up north in the Twin Cities. I'm national, bitch! He just gave me a blank stare, and raised an eyebrow. Are you done? Yes, she's done. She's done ranting like this since she was little. Once she stops talking, she feels better. Nightshade said. But I... you can't just... Ugh. I stammered. Stryker turned his head and spat on the ground. It seems you've grown quite a big head, young lady. Thank you. I was pretty sure you were going to call me an idiot like every pony else. I interrupted. Nightshade sighed. Shadow, what he means by big head is that you've grown a big ego when it comes to your misadventures with your friends. I crossed my forelegs and looked away from them. No one ever thinks I'm smart. Stardust walked over with an annoyed look on his face, groaning. Look, I know we said we'd give you privacy and all, but there's a lot of yelling, and we all know what you're talking about. We agreed it was a stupid argument, and put it to a vote of who should come and mediate, and I was a lucky buck who pulled the short straw. Stardust pulled out three wooden sticks from his saddlebags, giving them to us. Listen, these are your silent sticks. Not my idea, by the way, it was Windthrasher's. Anyway, no matter how dumb her idea might be, you're each going to take a stick, and when I take it from you, mind you, it's only temporary, you can speak. As the name implies, when you're holding the silent stick, you can't talk. I'll go in alphabetical order of who gets to talk. You'll get until I shove a silent stick down your throat to get your point across. 
Then I'll let whoever's next speak. I cocked my head. We could quiet down a bit if we're bothering you guys. Oh yeah, there's no yelling. If you yell, I'll let Wingnut shoot you with those blow darts Tonto gave him. Sardis nodded. We agree to your terms, Nightshade said, looking amused. I didn't agree, I argued. You're supposed to be talking things out, not bickering, like angsty teenagers with chips on our shoulders. You obviously feel like there's something you need to explain to me about this thing, your father, and yourself, and I don't know. Keep the peace, so to speak. Stryker retorted suitily. I wouldn't say keep... I started to say what was interrupted by Stardust. It's not your turn to speak. I'm gonna kill you, I swear to the goddesses. I said through my teeth. He smirked. Okay, fine. New rule. If anyone speaks out of order, I shoot them in the leg of their choice after one warning. I just sighed and waved my hoof to tell him to continue. Nightshade, since your name starts with an N, let's start with you. Stardust said. In a way, I betrayed our family by letting Grimoire, Shadow's mother, use Project Stargazer to save her life. Although technically, I didn't actually let her. She ended up pretty much taking Shadow and disappearing. I followed her as best that I could when I found clues or got information on their whereabouts. She didn't know the true location of Project Stargazer, so it took a while for her to track down its location. When I was able to finally confront her, she ended up getting the better of me after a long argument about how dangerous Stargazer was. I told her that nothing good can come from the laboratory. She either get our daughter killed or poison her with something worse. We all know what happened, of course, because Shadow isn't dead. But in all reality, what ended up happening was probably the best and worst thing that could have happened. Shadow was infected with the star demon Aquila, and her will was stronger and was able to hold her off. Stardust smirked. I didn't tell you that you could stop talking, so keep going. I don't care if it's something stupid or if it's going to scar me for life, just say it. No. Stardust smirk disappeared. Bummer, you're no fun at all. Okay, Shadow, you're next. You two clearly have some drama that needs to be resolved. But I want to say that I didn't survive because I have a strong will or anything. I might, but I'm pretty sure I'm only alive today because the deal I made with Aquila when I was little, and the spell Mom put on her to keep her trapped, or sealed in that magic cage doohickey in my subconscious? Yaksha's been trying to help me with controlling Aquila, and I know it's been working because I was able to use her magic when I stopped you two from going at it. I think if I work enough with Yaksha, I can completely drain her of all her magic. However, I think I might understand why you two aren't getting along. It's not over betrayal of family trust. It's because my dad stole Stryker's mare friend. That's a lie! Stryker interrupted. Stardust cocked a pistol. Ah ha ha! No talkie or you get bang bang. Do you want to pick a leg ahead of time, just in case? Shrekker just shook his head and looked away, as if ashamed that he'd forgotten the rules already. God, it's he was so uptight. I guess him and my father are alike in that way. I noticed the stranger's uptightness a few different times before, most notably when we were in the Twin Cities. Anyway, I continued, I think that since that was obviously years ago, and my mother is clearly insane with or without her memories of the past, Stryker got off lucky. Just sit and think about it. The same scenario would have happened no matter who she ended up with. She's proven to be manipulative in every relationship she's ever had. That also includes Vervain and Oricalis. She got Vervain to help her with finding and using Project Stargazer, and she got Oricalis to help her get the better at using magic in the wrong way. Stardust talked my stick back at me. Okay, I'm starting to get bored. Heard way too much about this project, and I'm grown to hate hearing about it. Sorry, Shadow, but the whole mommy issue thing is starting to get old. I'm not trying to be a dick, but hearing you explain your problems to every new pony, griffin, zebra, robot, hooker, alien, or whatever else you meet is kind of grinding my gears a bit, you know. Anyway, that's my part. Striker, now your turn. 
I'm not angry that Nightshade ended up with Grimoire. I'm angry because he shared our family's secrets with her when he wasn't supposed to. Sure, I might have volunteered some information before, but I wasn't young and stupid. Fortunately, I wasn't too stupid to give her too much information. All I gave her was a glimpse of what the project was, and that was it. If Nightshade would have just pretended he was going to do some other job during the day like our father did, we wouldn't have had this mess on our hands. Our mother went to her grave thinking our father was a respected officer in the Enclave, not a guardian of a super weapon. All in all, Shadow, you could still be right. I did notice now and again that Grimoire would push a bit when it came to certain questions, like she was just prying for more information. The whole relationship could have been a lie, and I could have been used by her and not known it. I was young and naive, with no sense of self-control when it came to mares with bad intentions. I don't know what she would have used Project Stargazer for if Shadow didn't take ill, but I know it could not have been good. Back to you, Nightshade, Stardust said, then laughed. I sound like a pre-war news broadcaster. You're acting a bit strange, Stardust. Are you okay? Nightshade asked. Yeah, I'm fine. Apparently, there's some side effects from the memory machine that last a little while. I get a little screwy sometimes. He replied. Indeed. <clears throat> Nightshade coughed a bit, being reminded that he is still heavily injured. Let's try and focus on the matter at hoof here, if you can manage that. The striker's right about something. I shouldn't have stored, shared any information about Stargazer with Grimoire. I think the thing that made me do it was that when we married, we promised to keep no secrets. And I didn't want to sabotage our bond with each other for poisonous secrets. I suppose that sounds foolish, but I was young and naive with no self-control. There's nothing we can really do about it now. So why fight each other like this? What's done is done. At the end of the day, we're still brothers, and we still tick together through thick and thin. No mare, job, duty, or loyalty, or something should come between us. That was a story I read a long time ago about two brothers who were on opposing sides of a war that happened in ancient times. Every time they'd meet on the battlefield, they'd put down their swords and start talking instead of fighting to the death. Eventually, one day, some of the soldiers saw them while fighting and also decided to sit down and talk with their enemy until the issues that caused the war were resolved. Because of their loyalty to each other as brothers, they accidentally brought about peace to their respective lands. Sure, it might sound a bit soft and pacifistic, but I'd have a story about a war ending with them talking it out, but I happen to like that story. I used to make me feel like having a brother was one of the most special bonds in the world until I discovered mares and started chasing tail. Oh, sorry, Shadow. I don't think you want to hear about my various conquests from before I met your mother. Stardust smiled and took my stick from me. Come on, let's hear it. Do you want to hear about all the nitty-gritty things your dad did with other mares before your mom? Fuck you, Stardust. Get your mind out of the gutter. No, of course I don't want to hear about that. What I want to hear about is what we can do to resolve this bitterness between my father and my uncle. Ah, oh, God, it says I've met two uncles so far. My father and my mother. When is this fucking family reunion going to end? Next thing I know, I'm going to get a run-in to with a long-lost sibling with some vendetta against me for being the favorite that mom and dad kept instead of trying to feed to a hellhound. Is it too much to ask for some goddesses damned normalcy in life? Why does my family lineage have to be so complex and come with responsibilities? It's like the wasteland is trying to fucking mess with me by playing some kind of cruel joke. If my life gets any more fucked up, I might just say fuck it and go on a killing spree. At least hell is a normal place to end up when you've done bad things in your life. Ugh, I'm going off track with this. Can someone please just have their turn already? You know what? I think we're done here. Stardust said abruptly. I'm just gonna <clears throat> go back over there now and uh, <clears throat> do things while the others, well, you hash things out. Some help you are. I said, trying to get my head back on track with the whole conversation that seemed to be just going in a circle of similar stories. 
Look, I know you two have problems with each other and all. Can we just please put all that aside and focus? Stryker let out a deep breath. I suppose you're right. It was a long time ago, and there's nothing we can do to chance what's happening already. Why waste any more energy in being angry? What do you say, brother? Truce. Nightshade looked at me, then back at Stryker, with a slightly surprised look on his face. Of course. I wouldn't have it any other way. Now, that's settled. Where should we start to figure things out? I asked, trying to break the silence. Dad was the first one to speak. I think we should talk about what happened all those years ago. Without fighting. It's only the true, true fire way to get the air fully cleared. Stryker looked like he'd bitten into a lemon. I know enough, Nightshade. I don't think you do, Stryker. You only know what you have been able to learn through other ponies or bits of information without getting the full puzzle pieces. You told me before that you left me the information I needed in your hideout. Right. Yeah, I left Dad's notes, my one finding, and even the location of where some memory orbs were. I left it for you so you could do what you needed to do when you took over for me, Stryker said. You mean the hideout in Nimbus? Dad asked. Stryker nodded. Yeah, I gave you its location when I left you the outfit and armor. That's the thing. I did go there because I figured you had a good reason for it. When I arrived, all I found was a few notes about Night Stroker and the Children of the Night, some of Dad's old recordings, and the Demon Slayer. And that was it. Riker looked confused. And that can't be all you found. I left instructions on what you needed to do. Everything about Stargazer and Falling Shadows. Even the location of another tower. I cut in. Falling Shadows? I heard that before in some of the scattered notes written by Minette. She mentioned something about it being in process, but never reaching its final stages? Becoming a myth? Because it is. There's been whispers about the project for over a century in Stratus and Nimbus. A long-lost project of Night Stalker and his team before the Enclave was formed. If a weapon like that was ever created, Night Stalker would have used it before the Mega Spells. Dad said. Stryker started to laugh. It was chilling sound to hear from that raw, burnt throat. <laughs> oh, brother, you really have no idea, do you? Falling Shadows is real, and yes, Night Stalker did try to use it on the same day the Mega Spells went off. The problem is, some pony locked down the program a few days before he could use it. And because of that, Equestria died, and Night Stalker spent mostly four decades searching for a way to unlock his project. It's not like Night Stalker's going to fail and at getting what he wants, I said, thinking back on some memory orbs that I've seen. Stryker looked over at me. It's not. I'm sure he would have kept looking for what he needed to, but something happened to him 40 years after the Enclave was formed. What happened? I asked. Dad answered. He was branded by two of his sons. He became a Dashite and had to flee the clouds. What does it have to do with what you're protecting? I asked. Stryker answered this time. Everything. Back before he was kicked out of Stratus, Night Stalker put a zebra he trusted in charge of overwatching the project, and his power source, using Stargazer, to make sure no pony ever tried to get it, either. This zebra was the first guardian, but by the time he left the Enclave, the zebra was getting old and had a tribe of his own. He didn't trust his own children to take over for him, so he asked Night Stalker to put a new pony in charge for protecting the projects and to help hide the children back then. That's where our family comes in. Our ancestors were the first guardians, and from then on we've been tasked with keeping it out of the hooves of both the Enclave and the ponies of the Wasteland. Wait a moment, back up. Night Stalker first wanted to use this project, then later changed his mind and wanted to keep it hidden? I don't understand. I asked. Stryker sighed. Night Stalker wasn't the same pony towards the end. Something changed within him and his life, look on life. Before he vanished from Equus, he started to try and fix the wrongs he'd committed over his life. He didn't want the project to ever be found or used. 
He would have destroyed it, but the only pony who knew how to do that was Minette. But she vanished a couple of days before the mega spells fell. So he hoped, by setting up the Guardians, he could make sure that no pony ever used Falling Shadows or Stargazer. What is Falling Shadows? I asked. Striker's face fell. Honestly, that's the one thing that's been lost over the years. Most think it's a super weapon. Others have said it was some kind of thing to fix the quest if it was ever destroyed by Veilfire and magic like it was. I've only ever heard a rumor that it was meant to make Nightmare Moon again, but I'm sure that's not true. The only thing I do know about the project is where its power sources are, the location of its two towers, and that Stargazer is needed to make it work. Dad spoke again. I'm guessing the power source is the one under Spitfire's Flight Academy. Correct. Though I'm not sure where the power source goes to. I have my suspicions, but I haven't been able to see if I'm right. What do you mean by its towers? I asked. Falling Shadows is a massive project, and whatever it's meant to do, it needs to be activated from four points in Equestria. And the first tower was easy, because it's a spire in the middle of the Crystal Empire. The other one I found is in Baltimore, in the middle of a large building controlled by Steel Rangers. I'm guessing there is one near the Badlands, but it's almost impossible nowadays to get near there, unless you're a zebra. The last thing I'm thinking is here a new Pegasus, Stryker said. Dad's eyes went wide. You think it's a lucky horseshoe? I do. But I've never been able to get close to it to find out. The locations of each tower were supposed to be in the Lucky Horseshoe, that much I know. I'm sure that all the information I need is in the Lucky Horseshoe. Stryker said. And since no pony can get into the Lucky Horseshoe because of Mr. Tops, it's impossible for you to find the information you need. I asked. That about sums it up. Stryker said with a sigh. Why do you want to find the other towers anyway? I asked. Dad chuckled. Stryker has been wanting to destroy Night Stalker's work for years. He's right. Ever since I was branded, I dedicated my life to tracking down Falling Shadows and Stargazers. I've hit a dead end with Falling Shadows multiple times. That's why I started hunting you, Shadow. When I saw Grimm years ago, she told me about Aquila getting free from Stargazer Labs. But she never told me who she bonded with. When I started hearing about the strange things going on in this mysterious courier mare, I knew she had to be the mare that had Aquila. When Yaksha told me about what she saw in you, I had to act, Stryker said. So he decided to kill me, and Dad was the best thing to do? I asked. I didn't plan on running the Nightshade when I found you, but I took the opportunity when I was told about him being with you. I sighed. You two always been like this? Dad looked over at me. What? Us two? Fighting and trying to kill each other? To my surprise, Stryker laughed. We're brothers, that's what brothers do. We fight. But no, we didn't always try to kill each other. Our father was very good at pitting us against one another, though. Dad wanted me to be more like Nightshade when I was growing up. He always was the better fighter, and I was always more in the terminals and books. Dad wanted his oldest son to be the fighter so he could take on the job as guardian, but Stryker always preferred his research. That's how he met your mother, honestly. They both worked in the same lab in the Crystal Empire, then later Nimbus. From what I've seen so far with both of you, you two didn't get along, I said, remembering the talk Stryker had with Mom in her memory orb. I wouldn't say we didn't get along. We were just competitive. As much as I dislike Nightshade now, I have to admit if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have survived after Dad died. Stryker said. What do you mean? When Stryker killed our father, I was put in charge of finding him once he ran away. The council wanted to kill him for what he did to our father, so I tracked him down and branded him instead. It was the only way he could live and escape the Enclave. But weren't you mad that he killed your father? I asked, utterly confused. The two brothers looked at each other. Then Dad said, No, 
We both hated our father. I knew why he did it, and I am happy that he's dead. Captain Everlight was a ruthless bastard who only ever cared about his job as the Guardian and helping the Enclave grow and take over. Which, funny enough, is the opposite of what a Guardian stands for, Stryker said. What do you mean by that? Stryker answered. The other part about being a Guardian is to make sure the Enclave doesn't get any more powerful. One Night Stalker was betrayed by the very system he helped to build, he wanted it taken down. Every Guardian has done their part to make it happen. I dedicated my life to breaking down their power through destruction and espionage. And I've done things like getting into the Council and changing the way the Enclave does things, Dad said. Stryker laughed. You did that for your own power, brother. I'm not our father, Stryker. No, I did it so I could make the Enclave better and change it from the inside. Seeing a fight about to start up again, I interrupted. So what did your dad do then? You said he did the opposite of what a guardian would normally do? Stryker looked back at me. A look of anger in his green eyes. He thought that the Enclave was fine the way it was. And he figured the Enclave should rule over all the wasteland, not just the clouds. He was power hungry. Is that why you killed him, Stryker? Both of them looked saddened. Finally, Dad said, Stryker killed our father because of a fight they had over Grimm. Wait, you killed him because of Mom? I asked. Stryker sighed again. Not just because of her, but that did start the fight. Grimm had been learning a lot about our family's secret, and Dad found out. He confronted me about it and tried to force me to kill her. I refused, and the fight got worse until he finally pulled a gun on me. Our mother had gotten between us, trying to break us up. Dad was so angry that he warned her that if she didn't move, he'd kill her too. She refused to back down, and he shot her. He killed his wife without a second thought, then started to threaten me again. I was so angry that I attacked him. Took a bad shot in the shoulder for that, but I was able to get away with the gun. Then, once I had him pinned to the ground, I put two bullets in the back of his head. Once he was dead, I came to my senses and ran, and went to find Grimm. Told her what I did, and told her I had to run. I didn't want her to leave everything behind for me. So I broke up with her, broke her heart, and got as far as I could from Nimbus. I'm guessing that's when you two started seeing each other? I asked Dad. He nodded. I'm sure Stryker doesn't see it that way, but... When I went to find Grimm, it was only to make sure she wouldn't say anything about what she knew about our family. I never intended on in falling in love with her. I mean, I used to have a crush on her when we were young, but it wasn't my intention when I started checking up on her. Back then, she didn't have any pony but her brother and Stryker. I felt bad for her, and thought she might hurt herself or do something stupid if she was left alone. So I visited her every other day when I had free time. And one thing led to another... I asked with a small smile on my face. Stryker looked like he'd just bitten into another lemon as Dad spoke. Nightshade, you still took her away from me. No, Stryker, you left her behind when you did what you did. You weren't going to come back for her. You need to get over it. Dad snapped. Honestly, you're lucky, Stryker. Mom turned out to be a nightmare, I said. Dad looked back at me. She wasn't always so bad, Star. She was a lot like you when you were younger. She didn't start lying and manipulating until you got sick. She would have done anything to save you, and she did. She gave up her life to cure you. You're wrong, Dad. Yes, she wanted to cure me, but she also wanted power. That's why she kept trying to find information on falling shadows. I said, getting to my hooves. They both looked at me, my dad asking, Where are you going? I'm going to sit with my friends, lay down with Aura and try to sleep. I'm tired of this crap with who did what and why from back in the day. I'm going to finish what I started first, and right now, that's getting to this meeting on time. I'm sick of this family drama. Dad, I love you, and I'm glad I found you again. But I think you should go back to Stratus before something happens because of how long you're down here. Maybe you can find something up there about Wolfsbane and how we can take him down. Uncle Stryker, if you want to stop by, uh, stop by killing me, 
then you can try. But I'll warn you, if you kill me, my friends will kill you. I'm not interested in that anymore. If you, if you think you can hold a quill off, at least for now. I'll look back at him. I'll hold her off as long as I can. Maybe it'll be enough for me to find a way to get rid of her myself. Since you aren't going to kill me, then I want you to leave and take Yaksha with you. Help her get to Frosty Summit so she can find Laser. Are you sure? Dad asked. I mean, we have so much to catch up on. I was just doing my best to hide the tears from my eyes. Just leave, Dad. Both of you, just go. I'm done with this shit. I don't even care anymore about what happened to any of you. Star. Dad said again, reaching my hoof out to me. I rounded on him. I'm not Star anymore, Dad. I'm Shadow. I'm not that sick little fool who used to hide on your back as we flew around the Crystal Empire. I'm not the weak filly who you told stories to. And I'm not the scared filly who used to need her uncle to protect her in the middle of the night when I was scared of everything around me. I'm Shadow Star, the mayor who has a job to do and too much on her plate to deal with my fucked up family. Until you realize that, I don't want anything to do with either of you or Flawling Shadows or Stargazer or the fucking Enclave. All I want to do is what I have to to keep the wasteland safe and to hopefully find a place where Aura and I can settle down and grow old together. I don't need you, or the stranger, or anything. I'm done. They both looked shocked at my sudden mood change. Then Dad sighed, saying, Fine, Shadow. I'll be going. He opened his wings, ready to fly off. As he did, Stryker said, Nightshade, what do you plan on doing about me? We still haven't settled things. As far as I'm concerned, brother, I never saw you. Let's keep it that way. I have my own mission to take care of, and so do you. Dad said, putting his mask and desperado hat back on before flying towards the clouds. Stryker chuckled to himself and looked back at me. Shadow, if I see any hint of that monster poking through you, I'm going to finish what I started. I'd like to see you try, I replied. That just made him laugh harder. Just like your dad. I'll see you again, Shadow. Until then, don't get yourself killed. It'd be a shame if some pony got to you before me. He walked over to where Yaksha was, still sitting with my friends. He said a few things to her, then flew off. Yaksha looked at me once, then yelled, I hope that one day you can forgive me, Shadow. Just remember what I taught you, and remember that I never once lied to you. She pulled up the hood of her cloak and vanished. When she was gone, I walked over to my friends and sat down next to Aura. We all need to get some sleep. We have a long day tomorrow, and I want all of us to be ready for it. They all looked at me like I was nuts. Windthrasher saying, Um, Shadow? What happened? Rolling my eyes, I said, Nothing. I'm just sick of dealing with my family's drama. I'd love to sit here and talk with my dad about a whole lot of stuff, but he's been away from Stratus too long, and I'm really sick of talking about stuff that doesn't matter right now. Why did you let Yaksha go? Wingnut asked. She's the one that told that Pegasus where you were. Because I don't think she meant us any harm, that's why. I said. Secrets notwithstanding, I was starting to enjoy Yaksha's company. She's a better cook than any of us, and it seems everything she made gave us benefits, mentally and physically. Wingna continued. If you think about it, she really didn't lie about anything. I hope we see her again. I sighed again. Maybe, kiddo. But she does have her own agenda. Though part of me would like to see Laser's reaction to seeing her beloved, to be dead friend, alive and well. Shadow. Do you need to get something off your chest? You look really upset. Windthrasher said. I don't need to talk about it. I said, getting my hooves again and heading towards a spot or a setup for us. Come on, Shadow. Darda started to say. No! I rounded on them, yelling. I'm not in the mood to talk about this. It's just too much shit all at once. We have enough to deal with right now. Or I got up and my friends looked at me with scared expressions. Shadow, you don't need to get mad. Now about we just go down and get some sleep? 
She lives with a small sleeping spot. I just want to deal with these burdens anymore, Aura. Why can't my long-lost family just stay away from me? I thought you wanted to find your dad. I did. But that was mostly because I didn't know what happened to him. Now I find out the stranger is Nightshade, the fucking High Council pony of Stratus and Nimbus, and he's been following me around, talking about my dad when he was my dad. It's too much, Aura. I understand. Yeah, I really do. But right now, we need you to calm down and rest. I need you to calm down and rest. I don't want to calm down. I want to be pissed. I said, fuming, as I sat down on some blankets. She sighed and took one of my hooves in her talons, lifting it up for me to see. Don't kid yourself, Shadow. Look at this. I almost gasped when I saw my coat was turning white again. You need to calm down right now. Because you're scaring your friends. You're not acting like yourself, and now your coat's changing. Now there's a word that Aquila's going to take over again. Now I could feel that I was holding onto her magic. I let it go and watched as my coat changed back to its normal hue. I didn't even know I was doing that. Yeah, I figured as much. Now how about you go to sleep, and we can continue on in the morning. Maybe you'll feel better. She gave me a gentle kiss. I did feel tired. It had been a long day, and an even longer night. Okay. I'll try. And I'll stay with you while you fall asleep. She said, starting to hum to me a little as my eyes slowly closed. Again, class, why do we stay in the stable? Miss Bind said, the old mare who taught us. One of the fillies who sat in the front of me put a hoof up. Oh, Miss Blind, I know. Of course, she did. Bassett was Tinker's daughter and a know-it-all. Miss Bind pointed a hoof at her. Yes, Bassett, do tell. The reason we never leave Stable 28 is because the outside world's too dangerous. The Balefire Megaspoles destroyed most of the land outside the stable, leaving the land poisonous and inhabitable. Therefore, it would be deadly for us to step hoof outside the stable door. She said with a smug-sounding voice. Very good, Bassett. Miss Bind said. Stable Tech put the stable to save us from the destruction of the war. They knew that in the event Equestria was ever to be destroyed, our race could continue to live on. Milkshake put up a hoof. Not waiting to be called on, she said, Miss Bind, that can't be true. If the land outside of our stable is destroyed, then where did Shadow and Grim come from? Strawberry Milkshake, today's class is not about what may or may not be outside the stable. That's for a more advanced class. But it does. You said that the world was destroyed, and if that was true, then they shouldn't be here. Milkshake said. I was doing my best to not get noticed from the rest of the class. They looked back at me. Miss Bind rolled her eyes, saying, Shadowstar's appearance in Stable 28 with her mother isn't that surprising. It's more than possible they came from a stable that isn't far from here. Something likely happened, resulting in Shadow's lost memories. They're both unicorns, and unlike us Earth ponies, they most likely have magic that can protect them from the deadly world outside. At least for long enough for them to get it here. And that doesn't make any sense, Milkshake said. Looking over at my friend, I said quietly, Milkshake, just drop it. Miss Bind looked angrily as she replied, Strawberry Milkshake, I am the teacher here, not you. If you want answers of how they got here, then ask Grimoire herself. Though I don't think you'll get an answer. She's a very private mare who doesn't like to discuss her life before she came here. Or maybe you can get Shadowstar to tell you. Oh right, she can't because she had no memory. Or so she says. Now sit down and be quiet or I'll call the overmare. Milkshake sat down in a huff and didn't say another word as Miss Bind went on telling us about this stable tech and all they did to protect the earth ponies in stable 28. When the lesson was over, I followed Milkshake out of class. Why'd you have to keep going, Milkshake? You knew she wasn't going to say anything about the outside. I don't think she should be teaching about stuff she doesn't know anything about. It's been almost 200 years since the war. How does she still know the world's poisonous outside? Come on, Shadow. Your mom and you didn't just pop out of thin air. Milkshake said. I agree with you, Milkshake. Bassett said as she ran over to join us. I mean, you had to come from somewhere, right? Oh, come on, Fawcett. We hang off every word she says like it's hard fact. Milkshake said like we headed towards the atrium. I do not. I just make sure to know what I need to. 
I want to make sure I get good grades so I can get a good job when here when I'm older. And that doesn't mean that I believe everything she tells us. Why do you care about that right now, Fawcett? We don't have to worry about our jobs that we'll end up doing in another eight years, I said. It's never too early to start thinking about how you can help the stable shadow, Fawcett said. Rolling my eyes, I replied, like I care about what I'm doing with my mom, older. I'm a unicorn. The only place they'll be of use here is in research and development, like Mom. It's better than being in a sanitation like Tumbleweed's dad, or full care like my mom, Milkshake said. So, Fawcett, where do you want to do when you grow older? Fawcett smiled wide. I want to be a pit black technician like my dad. I laughed. How would you want to do that? That's like the most boring job in the stable. The pit bucks rarely ever have problems, so there's never anything to do. Fawcett's eyes went wide. It's the most important thing to do in this shadow stable. Under the Overmare, that is. Without our technicians, the pit bucks would be stopped working ages ago. Also, apart from keeping the pit bucks working, Dad's job also involves resetting pit bucks for new users, and he has to keep the terminals in the stable running as well. It sounds boring to me, I said. Oh, fine, then what do you want to do when you're older, Shadow? Fawcett said in an annoyed voice. I don't know. Maybe security? Or administration like Auntie does? At least those jobs, America can get some respect in this dump. The other two both laughed at Milkshake, saying, I don't think you could ever be in a job like that, Shadow. Why? You're too small for one, Milkshake said. You also need to be brave and strong to be in security. Same for administrator. That job requires you to deal with every pony in this place and make them listen to you. As if every word you said was from the old mayor herself. I puffed up my chest and tried to look tough. I can be a brave mayor if I wanted to. Fasset grinned at Milkshake, then back at me. Brave enough to sneak to level 10? Milkshake looked shocked at that. Fasset, we can't go down to level 10. We'll get in trouble. That's where everything that runs this place is. Yeah, it is. And it's always been patrolled by security. If Shadow really thinks she's brave, then she can prove it. Daddy told me that there's a room close to the catacombs that holds a whole lot of sweets. It's rations in case something happens on level 9, and we can't grow stuff for a while. We should all go down there and steal something, she said. I really didn't want to go down there. Mom always said to stay away from level 10. But I didn't want either of them to think I was scared. Milkshake was one of my only friends, and I hadn't gotten to know Facet very well in the year and a half I'd been in the stable. But she was warming up to me, and I really wanted to be her friend. Even if she wasn't know-it-all, she was one of the most popular fillies in our age group. And if she was my friend, maybe the rest of the class would be nicer to me. So all you want us to do is sneak down there and steal some sweets? I guess we can do that, but what if we get caught? I asked. We'll be fine. The worst that'll happen is we'll have to work in sanitation for a week. Even if we do get caught, it'll be a blast. Facet said happily. I don't know, Facet. My mom said it's really dangerous down there. We could get hurt, Milkshake said. Come on, Milkshake, don't be such a drag, Facet said as she walked towards the elevator. I thought you were cooler than this. I thought you were a good little filly who knows everything, Milkshake snapped. Facet beamed. I am, but that doesn't mean I don't like to have fun, too. She pushed the call button on the elevator. You coming, Shadow? I looked over at Milkshake, then back to Facet. Then, back to Milkshake, saying, Come on, Milkshake, we'll be fine. She took a step back. No, I'm not going. You two can get in trouble if you want, but I'm not doing it. The door of the elevator opened, and Facet stepped in. Fine, be that way. Shadow and I are going to have a little fun. Come on, Shadow. I started to walk towards Facet when I felt Milkshake's hoof on my shoulder. When I looked back at her, she said, Shadow, don't go. You don't need to prove yourself to her. Milkshake, I'll be fine. Don't worry. We'll see you later tonight. If you go down there, I'll tell your mom, Milkshake said. I pulled my hoof away. Fine, tell her if you want. But good luck getting her away from her work long enough to tell her anything. By the time you tell her anything, we'll be finished. I saw a few tears in my friend's eyes, and she stomped a hoof and ran off towards the living quarters. I walked over and got in the elevator with Facet. She smiled and pressed a button for level 10. I'm guessing she ran off to tell some pony. Yeah, she said she was going to go tell my mom, I said as they 
walked in the elevator and it moved downward. Figured as much. She's too scared to do anything fun. Not like you. You seem like a super cool Philly shadow, even if you are small. She said as the door opened and the large open cavern of level 10. We both poked our heads out of the door, not seeing any pony. Both of us snuck into a large opening. Bassett took the head, a lead heading down the deeper tunnel of the cavern. As we got closer to where the catacombs met the main area of level 10, we heard voices. One was a mare. I hate this crap. Just because I made one stupid little mistake, I got to guard level 10 for a month. I'm so boring down here. Another mare answered. Yeah, I agree. But it's better than guarding the overmare's brat of a daughter, Wildfire. She's such a bitch. Do you know what she had me do yesterday? No idea, the first mare said. She had me follow around that unicorn grimoire spell. She seems to think she's hiding something. The first mare giggled. That had to suck. It did. She kept teleporting away every time I got closer to her. If she's hiding anything, there's no way any of us are going to find it. Wildfire has no idea what she's doing, the second mare said. I peeked around the corner of the hall we were in and saw two security mares walking towards us. They're coming this way. Fassett moved over to one of the doors that lined the hallway, saying quickly, Hurry, let's hide in here. She opened the storeroom, and we both ran inside. The door closed behind us right as the two mares came around the corner, one saying, So you think that one day that bitch is going to be our mare? Yeah, but at least it won't be for a long time. One of the mares said as she stepped right outside the door. Shit. The other mare stopped as well, asking, What? Something's happened upstairs. The old mare is being rushed to medical, but the boss is calling us back to security. The sound of their hoofs stopped closer and echoed down the hall as they ran off. When they were done, Fawcett and I both stepped out of the room. I looked over at her, saying, I wonder what's going on with the old mare. Probably tripped over something again, or drank something she shouldn't have. Who cares? Now's our chance to get back to the room. If we do, I'll believe that you're brave and cool. Bassett said as she ran back towards the catacombs again. Yeah, I'm right behind you. I said as we both headed towards the room. With no pony around, it was a lot easier than it should have been. Soon, we were standing in front of the door. Bassett grinned wide. Now all we have to do is go in and get it. We're good. She pushed the button and opened the door. But it didn't open. I looked over at her, saying, It's probably locked. She looked over at me. Then open it. You're a unicorn. Don't you have a spell that can unlock doors? And the only spells I know are telekinesis. I said with a shrug. Darn, I thought you could get us in. As I said, sounding disappointed. And Mom hasn't taught me any more spells. The Overmare always has her working late into the night. Can't be helped. And I was hoping to see what they had stashed in there. Daddy said it's really good stuff, too. She said as she looked past the doorway that led to the rocky catacombs. Hey, maybe there's something interesting in there. Bassett, I thought we were going to go this far. I thought you were brave. She said with a wink. Come on, we got this far just fine. It's not like anything's going to happen in here. Don't be such a fool. She trod off past the doorway and towards the reactor on the other side of the door. I walked past the door myself, saying, I'm not a fool, Fawcett. This is real dangerous. Mom said so herself. She trot towards back me. Shadow, come on. If you back out now, I'm going to tell the whole class. No, Milkshake was right. We shouldn't be down here. She reached out with a hoof, pulling me towards her. I'm going to make you come with me, Shadow. I'm not going in there alone. I tried to pull away. Fawcett, you're hurting me. Stop. She kept pulling. Stop your whining and grow up a little. I was scared of going any further, and I could feel something building in my horn. The facet, please, let me go. You're scaring me. She rounded on me and poked my chest with her free hoof. I said grow up. It's not that scary down here. Now come on. A charge came over me. I felt as if all my fear drained away, only to be replaced by pure rage. I ripped my hoof away from her and yelled. She said let her go! Fasset looked back at me with fear in her eyes. The, the hell happened to you? A blast of magical energy exploded from my horn, throwing both of us back. Fasset was slammed into the wall, 
I went flying through the door. As quickly as the rage had filled me, it was gone. I looked up to where I was lying on the floor and saw Fawcett lying next to the wall. She moved her head, looking over at me, with her eyes unfocused. I shook my head and said in a weak voice, You okay, Fawcett? She shook her head, too. Now how'd you do that for? Before I could say anything, a loud crack echoed throughout the chamber. Looking over, I saw Fawcett. I saw a rock in the cavern wall poking out of the ceiling. A ton of cracks running up the wall to it. Pass it. Run! I was too late. Before I could do anything, the stone fell and crushed the lower half of the filly under its immense weight. She screamed, the upper half of her body flaying until she stopped moving. Her eyes were wide open as she died, blood leaking out of her mouth slowly. I did my best to get back to my hooves so I could run over to her, yelling, Help me! Help me! Somebody help! I barely made two steps before a flash of blue light and Mom was standing in front of me. Shadow, what happened? Why are you all the way down here? Mom, I didn't mean to do it. I'm sorry. I said, crying as I ran to her. She hugged me tight, saying, Did what? What happened? Then she looked back and saw the body of Facet half crushed under the large rock. No, no, Shadow, what did you do? She scared me and I blasted her with a spell. I didn't mean to. I don't even know I could cast that spell. She looked back at me, and something in her eyes seemed to scare her. No, not again. What do you mean, not again? I asked, growing scared. She sighed, and her horn glowed. I'm sorry I have to do this, Shadow, but it's for your own good. There was a flash of bright blue light, and the world seemed to vanish. My head got all fuzzy and cold, as if I was in some kind of strange dream. At that point, I heard Mom talking to Auntie. It happened again, Vervain. I thought I suppressed Aquila, but she managed to get through anyway. Are you sure it's not her, and not Shadow's natural ability? You told me yourself that she was born with more power than any filly you've seen. I'm not sure, really. But when I checked the cage to have Aquila locked up in, I found some small cracks in it. I'll have to put more power into it and maybe block some of Shadow's power as well. I mean, she blasted a chunk out of the ceiling and crushed that poor filly. Mom said, sounding stressed and tired. Did you tell Tinker? I used a memory spell on Milkshake and Shadow, so they both won't remember that Shadow went down there with Facet. I told Tinker that I was going down to level 10 to check on the reactor, and I heard something falling in the catacombs. He thinks his daughter was exploring where she shouldn't have, and did something that caused a rock to shift and fall. Security is ruling it's an accident, Mom said. This isn't good. I guess we're just lucky no pony else saw them down there. Also, do you know what happened with the Overmare? I heard she's in medical and she's not doing well. Vervain, I lost control and something went bad. The Overmare isn't going to make it through the night. By tomorrow, Wildfire is going to be the new Overmare, and once she is, she'll start doing whatever she can to get Shadow and myself thrown out of here. Mom said. Auntie gasped. Grim, what did you do? I'll tell you about it later. Right now, I need to do what I can to help my daughter. Once I'm done with that, I'm going to leave and start preparing to leave. Leave? Why? Auntie asked. Vervain, listen. Right now, I need you to go get the Mark II and start setting it up for a new user. Had the files on it like we talked about. We may only have a few days to do this. A week, if I'm lucky. Grim, it could take me months to do that. Try and do what you can. I'll contact the Elder once I'm done with Shadow and let her know what's going on. Fine, but try your best to stay out of Wildfire's radar. You know she hates you, Auntie said. As they talked, I started to pass out again. The last thing I felt was Mom casting another spell over me, saying quietly, I hope that one day you can forgive me for the Shadow. It's for your own good. Book blinking slowly as I looked up at the bright yet cloudy sky. That dream was no dream at all. It was another memory that I'd forgotten because of Mom. Bassett had been a fun filly in my class, popular and very smart. She'd always been a little bitchy when I first came to the stable, but she started to like me as time went on. Before I got in my memory back, I thought she had died in an accident, just like every pony else in Stable 28. It happened on that same night the Overmare died. Tinker had been so sad. A month before, his wife had died in an explosion that happened on the second level of R&D. 
He lost his wife and child within one month. Yet he was always a kind stallion. The loss of Facet had almost driven him mad. He was out of his workshop for a whole month during his time, leaving his young apprentice to run the putt-buck repair stall while he grieved. When he came back to work, he was a lot quieter, but he always took the time for fillies and cools when we came to talk to him about pit bucks. I felt sad because now I knew that Facet didn't die because of something she had done. She died because of me. I lost control of my magic for only a moment, and a young filly who hadn't even turned eight yet died because of it. I always thought the first pony I ever killed was that raider mare and her two friends under the bridge that day of Stable 28. But it wasn't. Facet had been the first pony to die because of me. Slowly, I got up and looked back at Aura, who was laying beside me, softly snoring. Her beak was slightly opening, and she kept twitching, almost like she was in the middle of some kind of fight or maybe something else. I moved my head down and kissed her cheek then walked over to the now-dead fire and sat next to it. No pony else was up yet, so I took the time to pull out Mom's spellbook and started reading about memory spells again. So far, I'd been able to get through about ten of the spells. I couldn't perform them, but I didn't need to. I was mostly looking for something that matched the kind of memory loss Mom was suffering. I was just starting to read about memory extraction when I heard a tired voice of Oricalis come from my saddlebags. Why are you up so early, Star? You really should get as much rest as you can. Reaching my saddlebags, I pulled out the gem that he was still trapped in. I'm not tired, and I really need to see if I can find what's wrong with Mom in this book. The gem started to pulse with black light as he spoke. I don't think you're going to find what's wrong with Grimm in there. Looking back up from the book, I asked, Why? Because I don't think the report about what happened is true. None of her symptoms match any memory spell that I know. Maybe she knew more than you did, I said, going back to reading. He laughed. Star, I know more memory spells than Grim does. She was just better at casting them than me. All the spells in that book she got from me when I was teaching her. The reason I said that is because she shows signs of random memory loss. You see, if she had lost her memory because she was hit with a spell that took away her memories of the one you loved most, she would have forgotten everything about you. She wouldn't have remembered that she even had a daughter. She did forget about me. For all I know, you filled her in on most of what she knows. I filled her in on the fact that you died, because that's what she told me when I left. Stable 28. When I found her, after she'd lost her memory, she remembered everything up until the day she went to Stargazer. That, however, wasn't the strange part. After that point, her memories were scattered and strange. She never remembered going into Stable 28, but she remembered a mare who knew she did, and that took the Mark II with her. She had some memories of traveling the wasteland, but as she did, she did so as if she was a different pony. She had memories of going to Manhattan and Baltimore, but she never remembered seeing her old lover Stryker there. It was like anything that had to do with you or her mission was cut into pieces and some of her memories replaced with false ones. He said, Wait a moment. How would a memory spell like that work? I asked. It wouldn't. At least not with a spell that backfired on her like is reported. I honestly think that some kind of artifact was used on her. Something with enough power to get past her protection spells. So there isn't a way to fix what's wrong with her in here? I said, setting the book down. I didn't say that. It can't hurt for you to still try and learn what you can. Your mother's spellbook has a lot of useful things, not just memory spells. They may help you in the future. It may even be a spell that can help you put her mind right. He said with a sigh. I could teach you some if I wasn't still stuck in this blasted crystal. Wait a second. 
When Sherbert trapped you in there, she said something about Grimm's notes about you being right. What if the spell she used to trap you is one of Mom's spells? He was quiet for a moment, then he said, Grimm was the only pony who knew almost as much about me as myself. She would have had knowledge on what to do if she ever needed to trap me. I started looking through the spellbook. So far, I only looked at the spells that had to do with memory magic. As I flipped through the pages, I finally came to one that looked like it was the one that I needed. It was titled, Dark Soul Trap. So I started to read. In light of what I've seen of my brother's power and how dark his soul is becoming due to his transformations, I started to look into some kind of dark magic he's using. Ignoring the stuff about how to control the magic and the steps he had to take to get his body as it is now, I found old zebra magic that can be used to trap a pony like him in a crystal. The crystal has to be as clear as possible, imbued with a small amount of light magic, and last you need to put an ancient zebra glyph for entrapment on the crystal. Once that's done, you cast a spell of entrapment and pull the shadow into the crystal itself. Once that's done, he'll not be able to get out on his own, at least for a long time. The light magic inside the crystal will keep him weak. In case I need to trap him in this way, but don't want him stuck in there for too long, then I also have a measure to release it once it's been captured. I'm recording the spell for both in here, just in case I ever need to use them in the future. I read the next two lines. The spell for being trapped and releasing were both simple. I can do it with no problem. Uncle Ori, I think I can get you out of there. Are you sure? He asked, his voice sounding hopeful. The spell to put you out doesn't look hard at all. It's just a simple spell of release, I said. Then I think you should try and get me out of here. I'll be a lot more useful to you after I'm freed rather than trapped in this thing. Placing the crystal down next to the dead fire, I started to concentrate my magic on the crystal itself. According to her notes, I had to try and feel for Orichalus's power. Since his body was nothing but living dark magic, all I had to do was find it in the depths of the crystal and pull it out. Using the spell in her notes to open the lock on the crystal itself, to let the darkness pass through. Closing my eyes, I started to sift through my power. At first, all I could feel was my magic, a warm, pulsing light. The light seemed to fill my mind's eye, giving off pleasant sense of peace. At first, I wanted to just let my mind enjoy the feeling that I remembered that I had to look for Uncle's power. So I dug further and pushed my magic through the crystal's depths. At first, the sense of peace and warmth grew stronger. But as I went deeper, a sudden chill seemed to appear around me, like a slight cold breeze hitting you in the face right after you got out of a nice hot shower. I focused on that feeling, delving into it deeper, into that dark, cold space within the crystal. It started getting colder. I could feel the darkness starting to surround me, taking away any feeling, leaving nothing but hopelessness. The further I went, the worse the feeling grew. I started to think to myself, you can't do this. It's hopeless. I'm too weak. I had to ignore the feelings if I wanted the spell to work. Finally, once I reached the place within the darkness that was so cold I could barely stand it, I felt a spark of life. To my mind's eye, it was like looking at a small ember barely visible on the darkest of nights. A small red and white light in a sea of black. I reached out and took hold of the small speck of light. As soon as I did, I could feel the enormous emotions pouring out like a flood. The speck of light was feeling fear, pain, and anger, and sadness all at the same time. The light in the sea of black despair could only be one thing. It has to be the small speck of light that was left of my uncle's soul. As I held onto it, something I read once came back to me. Darkness cannot exist without light, and light, no matter how bright, will always cast a shadow. Giving a place for darkness to thrive. In all darkness there is light, and in all light there is darkness. I couldn't help but smile as I thought about that. Even a monster like my uncle had a speck of good within his sea of dark. Maybe there was hope for him. He just needs to find his way back to the light. If I could help this small amount of light grow, maybe he'd be a lot happier. It's funny that even as I thought that, I remembered what he did to Silver. Could he be forgiven for that sin? For that disgusting act of hatred? 
Maybe not, but I'd have to try. Grabbing the speck of light and the surrounding darkness with my magic hold, I started to pull it out of the crystal. As I did, I cast the spell to unlock the seal, trapping him in there. As I finished, I opened my eyes and saw the crystal shaking on the ground, the blackness within growing stronger. Then, with a loud crack and a flash of light, the crystal broke, and the shadow inside poured out. A moment later, the shadow formed itself into a pony shape with dark purple eyes and a violet horn. He looked at me and said, Thank you for getting out of me out of their shadow. It's the least I could do. The eyes fell as he said, You could have left me in there for a long time if you wanted. I would have deserved it too. Maybe so, but I have a feeling that you're trying to do something good for a change, Uncle Ori. You may not know it, but deep down there's still as little good of you left. He chuckled a little. Your mother used to say the same thing. Though I'm not sure there is. Every year I seem to fall further into the hatred and despair this body puts on my mind. It's another price for taking this farm. It, is there any way to get your body back? He looked back at me again. This time his eyes looked curious. There's only one way for me to get my body back. I would have to break the deal I made with the darkness. Deal with the darkness? What does that even mean? What deal? I asked, utterly confused. When you were hurt and almost died, I knew the Enclave would come after me. Nightshade was going to make sure I was executed for my crimes. He never liked me, and when you were hurt, he wasn't going to risk it happening again. So I did the only thing that I could think of to make sure I could live long enough to find a cure for you. I looked at him, confused. What do you mean, Uncle Ori? I opened a gate to a place called Tartarus, where Celestia and Luna imprisoned many dark creatures that tried to take over Equestria. One of them is known as the Lord of Darkness. His name is Mezzanote. He is the one who first made dark magic and controls it. I offered him my body as payment for this power I now have. If I were to break our deal, I would have to return to my old body, and my old power, and I'd die. Why would getting your old body back kill you? I gave my body up almost sixteen years ago, Shadow. I doubt it's in any condition to survive if I got it back. I guess I can understand that. So what was this deal you made? I asked. There were two parts to this deal. Part one is that I would give my body up for power, but you already know that part. The other part of the deal is that I would help Grimm find and activate an old project of the Children of the Night. So far, I haven't said that I will not help my sisters with this goal, so the deal is still valid. As soon as I turn my back fully on her, my deal will be broken, and I will most likely die. So... Sooner or later, you'll have to decide between helping me or helping Mom. He nodded. Indeed. An impossible choice. It's truly a matter of life or death. What do you think you'll do when the time comes? I saw a crease appear in the shadow's head, almost like a cocky smile. I think you know which I'll choose, Star. He said, turning back into a smear of darkness and merging with my shadow. I sighed and went back to looking through my mother's spellbook, trying not to think about the fate that awaited my uncle in the future. Right now, I just did my best to figure out the memory spells. Maybe there wasn't something in here that could help her. But even if there wasn't, I'd still have to try. If I couldn't fix her memory, then maybe I'd be able to take everything away from her. With no memory at all, there'd be a small chance I could at least explain to her who I was, and who she was. I flipped through the pages more moving past the memory spells and trying to see what else I could learn from her spellbook. I know I should be doing my research, but my mind wasn't in the mood right now. Some chapters revolved around war magic, others had to do with healing, a few others had to do with transfiguration. There was one spell that made it so a unicorn could walk on clouds, and that could be useful if I ever got up to Stratus. I have to remember and try that spell sometime. Finally, I reached the end of the book, just about to close it when I saw something written there. 
property of Minette. This is how Mom learned so much about magic. Most of the spells in here were Minette's. I bet Mom just added a few of her own notes and spells when she had it. I would have gone back to reading and working on the memory spells more, but just then my friends started to wake up. So I closed the book and placed it back in my saddlebags. There'd be time for later to learn what I needed to do. And as I said before, Mom wasn't at the top of my list of crap I had to deal with. For now, I'd do my best to be happy with my friends. We'll have breakfast, talk a little as we eat, then continue on towards Crossroads Trading Post. Look! I can see it! Wingnut said, jumping up and down as he walked in front of me. About time, I'm sick of walking! Calm down, kid. You're still a little ways away from it. Nora said as she lazily flew over us. She was the lookout now, giving both Stardust and Wind Thrasher a break. Yeah, I know, but at least I can see it. At least you won't have to keep a lookout anymore, Aura. We should be safe now that we're close to Crossbow's trading post, I said. I don't care if we're a few feet away from it. You never know when some pony's gonna attack you, Aura said, flying a little higher. Or some monster, Zarda said, yawning. Though I doubt we'll see much trouble around here. The NLR keeps this area pretty safe for the caravans. But with what's been going on around here since we left the, tw the Twin Cities, that may not be true anymore. When Thrasher said, her ears perking up and listening for something. I swear I keep hearing something in the distance, but I can't be sure. Or look down at Wind Thrasher, saying... You're probably hearing the fire ants that live around here. They don't come out much during the day, but I know they have tunnels throughout this area. You're probably hearing them moving around under us. I don't know, Aura. It sounds more like hooves, she said. What if there are raiders around here? I laughed. I haven't seen a raider since Cartwheel. I don't think we have to worry about them this close to the NLR territory. We were right about the border of the NLR, Steel Rangers, and the Roman lands. Raiders wouldn't be stupid enough to come near this area. Bugs, I'd believe, but not raider. We were just walking past a billboard that had fallen down, but was still facing us with a big picture of Pinkie Pie on it, saying, Pinkie Pie is always watching. When the wasteland had to show me how wrong I was, eight dirty ponies ran out from behind the billboard all in patched metal armor and carrying guns that looked ready to fall apart. They blocked the road, all aiming their weapons at us. Aura landed in front of us, holding her spear ready for a fight. My friends and I weren't far behind in drawing our weapons. As we did, a big, mean-looking mare with a matted mane giggled to herself and said, Now look what we got here! A few ponies and a griffin traveling our road all alone! Move it before I slice you into tiny chunks! Aura said. She looked over at Aura, still giggling. Her eyes were bloodshot and a bit of foam seemed to be at the edge of her muzzle. Move? Why would I ever do that? You see, Griffin, this is my road. If you want to pass, you'll have to pay the toll. It's only eight nut jobs. Let's just kill them and move on. Stardust said. Um, Stardust? Windthrasher started to say. What, Windthrasher? There's a lot more than eight, she said, twitching an ear as back towards the way we come. Looking back, I saw ten more blocking the road. Where the hell did they come from? And how the hell did Windthrasher not hear them before? I sighed, then asked Windthrasher, Is that all of them? She shrugged. I don't know why, but I couldn't hear them. I only knew they were there because I just make out their heartbeats. But only because they're so close now. The man who spoke before giggled louder. She pulled back her dirty matted mane, and I saw a horn. The little spell of mine keeps my underlings quiet so that no pony can hear them while we sneak up to them. Useful spell, don't you think? Very. I said sarcastically. Fine, you said it's a toll road, so how many caps? I asked, not in the mood to deal with this nut job and her friends. She giggled, still, her friends joining. You said anything about caps. We don't need caps when we can take what we want. No, you see, if you want to pass me, we want three things. All of your weapons, your armor, and that colt traveling with you. 
No way you're getting any of that from us. Especially Wingnut. Why would you want him anyway? I asked. She licked her lips, slowly, her eyes getting bigger. Bulls are ever so much fun to play with. I love to use them as my fun little toys before killing them. They're ever so tasty when they're young. You're sick. Wingnut spoke out. She cackled crazily. <laughs> what can I say? She smirked. I get bored easily, and I need to eat after such a workout. So, not only are you raiders or bandits, but you're cannibals, too? I said. Oh, I so do hate the word cannibal. I prefer to be called a mare with exotic taste. I'm, of course, speaking of myself. My buddies around me could care less what they're called. She said, licking her lips again. Oh, yeah? Well, you're still a sick freak. And being a fucking cannibal proves it, Wingnut said. The smile on her face fell, making her look even worse. No pony calls me a freak. You know what? Fuck it, she cackled again. I was gonna let the rest of you go, but if you gave me what I wanted. Instead, every pony kill them all. She cackled one more time. I didn't give the chance to get a shot off. Trusting my friends, I fired my plasma rifle at one of the ponies in front of us. He was blasted back into another one of his comrades as the crazy mare jumped out of the way, firing her own weapon at Aura, who was trying to attack her. I heard Windthresher's ear-splitting scream from behind me. She must have gone for the ponies at our rear. One of the stallions came at me with a spiked hoofball bat. I ducked under the blow, twisting around and pressing the barrel of my plasma rifle under his chin. His head exploded as I pulled the trigger showering the ground in bits of blood and bone. Another pony slammed into me, spiked horseshoes digging into my barding. The blow hurt, but my barding was too strong for his rusty spikes to do any damage. I kicked backwards and felt my hoof connect with something soft. I heard an intake of breath and a small squeak from the stallion, and a moment later he rolled off me. Looking back, I saw him holding onto his stallion hood. Ow. I pulled out my sword and sank it deep into his chest, piercing his heart. Pulling the sword free, I looked around and saw a mare aiming a shotgun at me. I teleported before she got the shot off. When I reappeared, I swapped out my plasma rifle for the shotgun I'd found in Stable 97. The mare twisted around and found the barrel pressed against her chest. I smiled and pulled the trigger. The shotgun was so powerful, I almost lost hold of it with my magic. The damage it did was amazing. It tore right through her rusty metal armor and blew a hole in her torso. She fell, blood pooling under her as she gasped out for a last breath, a look of utter agony on her face. A bullet slammed into my barding, caused by another bruising to my ribs. I winced and turned to see another fire mare firing a varmint rifle towards me. I dodged her next shot and ran closer to her. She was blasting off her hooves by the shot, and the buckshot chewed through her armor like paper. I left her to scream and squirm as she bled out. Looking back towards Aura, I saw she was still trying to fight the unicorn mare. I was kind of surprised that the mare was still alive. Not many ponies could stand up to Aura this long, especially a raider. But I saw why Aura hadn't taken her down yet. When Aura was close and tried to behead the mare, the mare would teleport out of the way. She may be a crazy cannibal, but she knew some good spells. From what I knew of the wasteland, not many unicorns could teleport at all, and even fewer could do it multiple times. I was just about to go help Aura when a pool cue slammed in my face. I fell back and took another blow to the face as a stallion, almost as big as Night Stalker, stood over me. <laughs> Why aren't you a the little thing? Damn right I am, I yelled, aiming the shotgun up at him. He slammed his pool cue into the shotgun a moment before I fired. The blast missed by a hair. He moved to slam the pool cue in my face again when a bullet passed through the side of his head. For a moment, his body just stood there when it slowly toppled to the side. I looked towards where the bullet had come from and saw Wingnut standing there reloading old Festus. He winked at me and I saw another raider rushing behind Wingnut. I was about to say something, but Wingnut ducked underneath the raider, causing him to fly over the colt. I heard old Festus go off again, hitting the flying raider in the chest as their lifeless body hit the ground next to me. He smiled and ran off to go help Aura. I got back to my hooves and looked around for more raiders. The only two left were writhing in agony as Windthrasher screamed at them. 
Stardust aimed his rifle and fired twice, killing both. That's when I heard a yell from Wingnut. Let go of me, you ugly cow! Looking back to where Aura had been fighting the mare, she'd pinned Wingnut to the ground and was pressing a chipped and rusty knife to his throat. Aura was a few feet away, saying, You better let him go, you bitch! <laughs> I'm going to bleed this yummy colt, looking dry, and there's nothing that you can do about it, Griffin. She started to laugh, her horn glowing brighter as she readied herself to slit the colt's throat. I was just about to ready my teleportation spell, when a blast of air flew over the mare, throwing her off wingnut. Her body rolled and stopped right in front of Aura. Aura doesn't hesitate. She lifted her spear and sank it into the mare's head. Once she pulled it out, she looked over at Wingnut, yelling, You alright, kid? He got back to his hooves. Yeah, who the hell blew her off me? A filly with a bright white coat and an energetic blue mane, done up in twin ponytails, came walking down the road, an odd-looking gun in her muzzle. She holstered it, yelling down at Wingnut, now we're even, stupid bug. Wingnut's ears fell as she said that. Damn it. Not her. Well, I'm gonna go kill myself now. With the rest of the raiders down, I walked over to Cookie Bite. Hey, Bite. Thanks for the quick save. What are you doing out here? She looked over at me with an expression of boredom I'd forgotten she always seemed to have on her face. Oh, look, you're still alive. I'm surprised. Well, if you must know, Rusty got to Crossroads Trading Post early, and it's boring there, so I thought I'd go check out what's around this dump. A little far from Crossroads, just be wandering around, kid, Laura said as she put her spear back onto her back. Looks like you got your gravity gun fixed, I said. She rolled her eyes. It wasn't broken before. It was just too powerful and used a lot of power. I'm still figuring it out and tweaking it. But I still have to replace the power gem on it after four or five shots. I did, however, figure out a way to bring down the power with each shot, so that's good at least. Hey, who's this little filly? Stardust asked, kneeling down and getting face to face with her. Where's your parents? Don't you know it's dangerous out here for a little thing like you? Her eyes flared, and for a moment, she twisted around and bucked Stardust right in the face. Bite me, asshole! I can take care of myself. Stardust backed up, rubbing his bruised nose with a hoof. Damn, she's feisty. Windthrasher was doing her best to keep out of sight behind Stardust. I just rolled my eyes. Stardust, this is Cookie Bite. She's the niece of Rusty, Shack Rusty Shackles, who runs Trotston. I looked back at Bite. Why are you out here? I didn't think Rusty would let you join him for this meeting. He laughed. He wouldn't leave me behind. He thinks that if he's gone for a day or two, that, and doesn't take me with him, he'll come back to find out the town destroyed, or his house on fire. <laughs> I blow up my room one time just because I crossed the two wires when I was making double laser rifle, and he loses all trust in me. Oh, okay. So why were you out here again? I asked. Like I said, I was bored, so I was in exploring. Didn't think I'd run into you and a bunch of stupid raiders, Bite said. So, I'm guessing you're on your way to meet Rusty for this meeting with Annihilators? Yep, he asked me to help in the meeting, so here I am. Well, at least this day won't be as boring as I thought it would be. Come on, Crossroads Trading Post isn't far. Oh, and if I were you, I'd grab as much crap from these raiders as... It can before somebody else does, Bite said, walking towards Crossroads again. Wingnut was already doing that. I guess he'd rather do some work than spend more than a few seconds with Bite. She hadn't even gone a few feet before she turned back and yelled, Hey, Wingnut, are you coming or not? Laura, Windthrasher myself, started to giggle as a bright blush appeared on his face. I'm busy! No, you're not. Let the adults grab the crap. I want to show you something, so hurry up. Yeah, Wingnut. You better hurry up before your mare friend gets mad. Aura teased. She's not my mare friend, he said, glaring at Aura. Ah, oh, come on, Wingnut. She's so cute. I teased as well. I hate you all. 
he said, trotting past us, muttering under his breath. Otis only looked back at us and thought we weren't watching. His ears perked up and he trotted a little faster, a small spring in his step. Nora, Windthrasher, Stardust, and myself started to go through the bodies. As we did, Aura said, He really likes her. You think so? Stardust asked, looking back at Aura. Of course he does. He's just too embarrassed to say it, I said as I pulled a bag of caps from the unicorn mare's saddlebags. Damn. For a mare who doesn't care much about caps, she had a shit ton. Moonthrasher looked over at me. How much? My pitbuck says it's 2,000? I said, looking down at the Mark II's notification. Damn, that'll help a lot. We were running low. Nora said as she collected some ammo and put it in her own room bags. We can restock our medical supplies and ammo when we get to Crossroads. Good idea, I said as I finished with the last body. I think that's it. Should we go catch up with the two foals? Yeah, I don't like having Winglet out of my sight for too long. That kid has a knack for getting into trouble. Not almost as bad as you do, Shadow. Aura said with a quick giggle. We all started back down the road, the two forms of Bite and Wingnut just visible in the distance. It only took us another ten minutes to reach Crossroads Trading Post. It was nothing more than an overpass with shops set up all over the place, a few tents and the flag of the NLR flying over it. There were a few caravans on one side being guarded by a few ponies and a couple of griffins. I could see what looked like shacks set up near the overpass, where the NLR tents set up on the other side of the overpass. Even though I didn't like it, looked the like of it too much, it was busy with ponies moving from shop to shop, and goods were being traded like crazy. Damn, not really what I was expecting, I said as I got closer. I saw an NLR soldier standing guard next to the road that led up to the overpass. What'd you expect? A huge settlement with walls and ponies everywhere? Or asked. Um, I don't know. I mean, this is just an overpass. Why do you think it's called Crossroads? She asked with a chuckle as the NLR guard came walking towards us. Welcome to the NLR Crossroads Trading Post. What's your business here? He says, sounding bored. I have business here. I'm meeting the leader of Trotston and the Red Talons, I said. He yawned. Rusty's sitting over at the Katina right now. No Red Talons have shown up yet. You can go join him if you wish, but remember, no weapons are allowed to be drawn while you're within the trading post. No problem, I said, trotting past him with my friends. I just made it past when he seemed to wake up a little. Wait, are you the courier? Without stopping, I said... Yep. I can't believe it took him that long to notice who you were, Stardust said, trotting next to me. I just shrugged. Not like I care if he knows who I am or not. I'm here to do a job, not chat about the things I've done around here. I walked over to where I saw a few tables set up next to an outdoor bar. A cute older mare with a blue coat and curly black mane was serving a couple of stallions drinks. She looked over at me as I came closer and winked at me, not knowing why. As she did this, I couldn't help blush a little, and smiled shyly before making my way closer to where Rusty was sitting with Bite and Wingnut. Ah, there you are, Shadow. Nice to see you again, Rusty said with a small smile. And who's this stallion you have with you? This is my friend Stardust, the one who was taken by the Enclave when I met you before, I said, taking a seat across from him as my friends took the rest of the seats. Ah, yes. Happy to see that you're able to recover him from the clutches of the Enclave, Rusty said. I'd ha be happy to tell you about it later. Right now, I'm here for a job. You asked me to come help in negotiations? Why was that? I asked. He frowned a little. Well, for one, you're the only pony around who's been able to meet with both the leaders of Trotston and the Annihilators. I have quite a lot of trust in you after you helped keep me alive when I was attacked a couple weeks back. And I'm guessing Javelin has come to trust in you as well, if she's willing to ask you to help her set this up. I also needed to speak with you about a small matter regarding the Mark II, but we can deal with that after this meeting. Aura rolled her eyes. Why not just ask her about it now? The meeting is a star for a few hours. Well, I guess you're right. 
But what I have to say isn't very good news. Honestly, I'm taking a risk. Speaking of it here. Just spit it out, Rusty. He sighed. Fine. Uh, you see, Trotston is having a problem with the Steel Rangers as of late. Normally, we wouldn't worry too much because our defenses have been able to keep them away from our town for 15 years now. Yeah, and I still say you shouldn't have to worry about those bucket heads. But hey, they can't get into Trotston. Bite said in a huff. Yeah, I was under the same impression. Or did something happen? I asked Rusty. Well, you could say that. You see, I got a message from Elder Sapphire a few days ago. It came from the other Mark II. The one I thought was still in Stable 9. Here, I'll show you what she sent. He said, bringing up his pit buck and playing at the audio file. It started out with a mechanical voice. Message from Pipbuck Mark II SL, directly sent to Pipbuck Mark II AB. Please stand by. Then I heard the voice of Sapphire come out of his Pipbuck. Rusty Shackles, leader of Trotston. I am Elder Sapphire Stone of the Hidden Sand Steel Ranger. I'm sending you this message to give you a chance to give us the Mark II you have in your possession. A branch of the Steel Rangers has left your city thrive with a tech you have stolen from Stable 34 for 20 years now. We haven't tried very hard in the past to take what is rightfully ours because of the defenses your city has, but because your former elders didn't want to risk the lives of our Rangers to deal with you. This is no longer the case. You have a pipbuck that shouldn't be in the hooves of ponies who have no idea how dangerous it can be. Right now, there are only three that we know of, one of which is with the other courier, and the last is with you. You have five days to remove your Mark II, leaving all of its data intact and given to my knights. If you fail to do this, I will send every knight and paladin to Trotston to show you how little your walls mean to us. Trust me when I say that we're going to have enough firepower to take down your entire city. Now I am not an unfair mayor. If you do as we ask, we will leave Trotston alone and never bother you again. We will let Trotston keep on trading the tech you have now, without taking anything for ourselves if we get that Mark II. Think long and hard about this after, Rusty Shackles. Remember, there is more than one way for us to get what we want. And we will get what we want. I'm sure I don't have want your little niece to suffer the same fate that your sister did. I do hope that you make the right choice. The recording cut out. I looked up at him and saw a little chilled from what I'd heard. Still not able to believe I was hearing that right. There's no way Sapphire would ever hurt fillies or colts. She's not that kind of mare. I don't know this mare, but I have to take this threat as if it were true. Normally, I wouldn't worry so much, but from what I've been hearing about the movements of the Steel Rangers as of late, I'm not so sure we can stand up to them like I thought before, Rusty said. How much longer would you have to give them your Mark II? Windthresher asked. He sighed. Tomorrow's the deadline, and I don't know what I can do to stop them. I wonder why Sapphire wants the Mark II. She already got one, and you gave them Stable Nine. Zardas said. No idea, but if she wants it that bad, then there has to be a reason for it. There is more going on here, and I don't like it, I said, thinking hard on what to do. Neither do I, Rusty said. I've been trying to think of anything I can do to stop her from taking down my city. I may have an idea or two, but let me think on it. We have a day to figure this out. In the meantime, I think we should take care of this meeting. Maybe one of the Red Talons will have an idea. I'll ask them when they get here, I said. I guess that's the best we can do, at least for now, Rusty said, leaning back in his seat. We all sat there for a long time, none of us talking as time slowly slipped by. Finally, I said, While we wait, why don't you tell me what really happened between Trotston and the Annihilators? The look on his face was one of a stallion who's been caught in a lie. What do you mean? I told you before that all this started over a lover's quarrel. White slammed her hoof on the table and yelled, Damn it, Rusty! She came all the way here to help you, and you're just gonna sit there and lie to her about how this stupid thing started? Yeah, Rusty. If you really want our help, you better spill. Stardust said with his signature grin. 
Fine, Rusty said with a sigh. You remember when I told you about my sister, right? Yeah, she was the one who had my Mark II before my mom stole it, I said. And that's right. Well, this whole thing started because of my sister, the stallion she loved, and Cookie Bite. Footnote. Level up. New perk added. Bookworm. It seems you read a lot of books, but only get average benefit. Let's change that. From now on, when you read books, you gain plus two to your special attributes, and gain an extra 10% to skills when reading a magazine. <laughs>